cool. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Oops. Welcome to the talk, How to Get Your School Age Child to Sleep. And I have here the amazing international, national parenting expert, Sarah Ockwell Smith, um, who is highly, re she's a highly regarded, popular parenting author specializing in psychology and the science of parenting and gentle parenting and attachment theory. She has written the gentle sleep book, many books, but particularly the gentle sleep book, which has sold over a hundred thousand copies in the UK alone. That is amazing. So Sarah, welcome. Hi. I feel a bit scared now. That makes it sound like I'm going to fix everybody's problems and that I'm really wonderful. No. And, you know, how to get your child to sleep. Well, you are really wonderful, but we we don't expect miracles because we know because <laughs> we know we should never work with children and animals, don't we? Yeah. Right. And we should work miracles. Uh, so, well, yeah, it would be easy, wouldn't it? Just to have a magic wand. I know. And uh, yeah, I should have asked so, you to call this how to try to get your child to sleep. Yes. Okay. Or how to. Yes, absolutely. So how to yeah. try to get your child to sleep. I was just, uh, I just did a live just now reading a relaxation and I had a couple of children live on there. And then there was Joseph, he was four, all over the place. And I was reading the relaxation and halfway through, and he has relaxations every day. He goes, I'm just going to get my Mr. Man book. <laughs> I was mm -hmm. like, <laughs> brilliant. Anyway, so you're, the children we're going to talk about are slightly older, uh, school age. So what are the common sleep issues you see in school age children? Yeah, do you know, it's really funny. I think when people have younger children, there's this kind of sort of an assumption that as soon as they're two, three or four, that they'll suddenly just sleep and everything will be easy. And I, it's quite nice to talk about this tonight because I don't really talk much about older children, but... There's a, there's a whole heap of issues there that I know parents struggle with. So I'd say the top one is definitely bedtimes. So trying to get them to sleep and also particularly at a time that, that kind of matches up with what the parents would like. Um, so children, you know, who prefer to go to sleep 10 or 11 p.m. but the parents would rather they went to bed at 7 or 8 p.m. that's a really really common one and the the kind of refusing bedtime flat out or really stringing along the bedtime routine and not wanting to settle down not wanting parents to leave is probably the top one in this age group um night waking actually is an issue at every age i think again it's one of the things that we think stops once you stop having a baby or a toddler but certainly waking up in the night is still quite common all the way through school um, in a younger sort of age range, you'd have things like nightmares and night terrors and waking up and being scared and not wanting to be alone is a good is mm. a popular thing. Um, on the older end of the scale, you've probably got the fact that they don't want to go to bed till midnight or 1 a.m. Um, on the on the younger end of the scale, perhaps waking up really early in the morning and then on the older end mm. of the scale, not being able to get them out of bed. So not getting mm. to sleep, waking too early or too late and still waking in the night. Yeah. Much and also, and yeah, and so, oh gosh, and if you have younger children and teenagers, so yeah. that's tough, isn't it? Because yeah. you've got the teenagers who go to sleep at 12 and 1, and then the little ones will be waking up about four or yeah. five hours later. No so, more time at all, no adult time. No, no adult time. But also, what's what has been the effect of lockdown and the lack of the school routine had an effect on children's sleep? Yeah, I think I've heard either way. So some parents have said, you know, my child's been much happier since they've been at home, particularly if the child was stressed at school for some reason, taking those stresses away, spending more time with parents, particularly when, mm. when people couldn't go to work and were at home. That can be really helpful. But I've heard lots of um, sleep struggles and also behaviour struggles, so more tantrums and defiance, and that kind of spills over into the evening. I think we're all maybe getting a little bit fed up of each other being around 24 7 um but also for children the loss of the routine of school has had a horrible impact for some of them there's i think 
think a lot of people mistake when I talk well when people talk about routine with sleep I think a lot of people think we mean very strict you know thinking back to the routines that people advocate with babies you must do this at this time and they must sleep at this time and you must have a cup of tea at this time so a lot of people are scared about routine but it's actually one of the most important things you can do for sleep so like one of the things that has the biggest impact on good sleep at any age whether you're talking babies or adults is having a regular wake time and a regular bedtime mm. and obviously children have that when they were at school but now it's gone out the window a little bit maybe they're having later nights and they're having later mornings and it's more flexible which is great on one hand but on the other hand that lack of consistency can actually cause havoc with sleep so mm. I think you know just the lack of routine is an issue I think maybe slightly in the earlier days there was quite a lot of anxiety so children picking up on things they've heard in the news or parents have said or they've just overheard or, or come across themselves um, and anxiety obviously always impacts sleep mm -hmm. and also I think they very much pick up on us if we are anxious then mm -hmm. they become anxious and that again will have a knock-on impact on their sleep so pros and cons it's the, the time yeah. together has been really good and actually the being able to take a breather and not, you know, sort of get off the treadmill of every day has helped. But that lack mm. of routine and anxiety has, has actually caused a lot more problems. So, and and at what point do you think parents? So we we're now in the in England anyway. I know Scotland they're starting to go back to school soon, but in England we are coming into the summer holiday six weeks, eight weeks for some. And um, at what point? So we had lockdown, now the summer holidays, and then there is going to be school potentially in September. Mm -hmm. At what point do parents need to start making that transition back to school? Or is there no transition? Should there be this routine continuously that you're saying? Yeah, I think it depends. You know, some people will do really well with a routine and I'm talking adults here and parents. Some would actually do much better without one. So I think we have to say that there's a little bit of I don't think there's a right way. There's the way that's right for you. So if you thrive on being spontaneous and having no routine, then absolutely go with that. If you yeah. are somebody who prefers routine, but particularly if you're worried about your child either starting school for the first time or going back, then from August, I would actually really start to try and get a bit of um, rhythm rather than routine I think is a nicer word into your oh, daily nice life yeah, so if, if you yeah if you know you've got to get up at seven o'clock every morning to go and do the school run I would start really sort of early to mid August at the latest so you've got a couple of weeks to ease into it I would start trying to get up at a similar sort of time start to aim for bedtimes at a similar time but I'd also go beyond that and sort of try to make lunch times a similarish time so that ah. the child, what you're doing basically is you're setting your body clock. So it's a little bit like if we go on holiday and it all goes out the window with jet lag, it takes a couple of weeks to get back into it. So by being aware of the, the sort of the rough timings of the day, it makes it much mm. easier for the child actually and for you as well for when they do start in September. So, yeah, like imminently, actually, I'd have a couple of weeks grace to just relax and do whatever you want and then get cracking. Wow. Well already. Gosh. Yeah. So start preparing. And yeah. so so with the rhythm thing and the routine rhythm you mentioned lunch lunch time possibly dinner as well having that routine and then all the nighttime stuff um would you even though it's the holidays start creating some sort of rough schooly feel that you don't mention it's school but just sort of so yeah. you have set activities so children can just have some sort of rhythm I think it depends on the child you know I, personally for me in a school holiday and I have four children who are school age um I personally it's a holiday we don't do anything vaguely school like apart from sort of wake times bedtimes and rough eating times but okay. for some children particularly those who I think are missing school in lockdown then I think doing I don't know something like if you have pee at a rough time doing some activity outside at that sort of time might help but I don't think you have to no I beyond wake time and bedtime and maybe lunch and dinner time I wouldn't worry about scheduling anything else Okay. Do you know what I think? You, it's, it's, you know, it's stressful enough having had mm. children potentially with you for the last 18 weeks, thinking, my goodness, how am I going to get through another six weeks? I think it's mm. stressful enough without having to add something else. But so can we ever get just you have a free for, free for all? <laughs> yeah, yeah, enjoy enjoy the holidays fully and then start making a little bit yeah. of changes towards the end. And it goes back to what so, I was saying earlier. So, you know, the least pressure on the parents, the less anxious they're going to be. And if parents are calm, 
then their children are more likely to be calm and that has a knock-on impact on to sleep as well so what you don't want is everybody really stressed because they're trying to follow some sort of routine in the daytime and then in the evening everybody's really tightly wound up and nobody can sleep and so parents getting calm is that something you cover in your work is that like how can parents start to <laughs> touch on that calm <laughs> it's, it's something I think every book I've ever written has got at least one chapter on your own feelings because you know we are mirrors for our children they see us and they they know whether the world is safe or whether it isn't whether they should be scared or whether they should be relaxed and they absolutely you know it's when you discipline a child it's much more about who you are and how you act than what you say and what you do so how do you be calm goodness I don't know you need to ask one of your other speakers I'm sure you've covered it but I That's think all right yeah you, you have to look be aware of your own triggers so I always talk about parenting consciously ah. so make sure that you're not doing or saying something because that's how you were raised stop and think why am I saying yeah. no to this or something um just and I also think you know I'm sure you're probably talking about self-care I actually really hate the term self-care because it makes it sound like another chore we have to do and if we don't do it properly we're no good so for me forget self-care just try yeah. and be kind to yourself yeah you don't have to go and do yoga or a walk or yeah. just be, be be kind and let yourself mess up and if you do don't worry tomorrow's another day yeah absolutely and just sort of do nice things rather than yeah. call it self-care just 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 enjoy enjoy life in the way that but it's so much nice about the ethos it's the way you talk to yourself and the way you treat yourself rather than what you do I think it has to if it doesn't start there there's no point doing the nice stuff if that makes sense yeah, and I think we have sort of half in or indifferent. I love all these talks because they've all been coming at the same situation from different angles. So many different, like the Jahari window, so uh -huh. many different ways to look at the same issue of parents and children and that dynamic, whether it's belief system or any trauma and the mirrors. And I, I just, I just love it. So it, it's it's really interesting and, and how, you know, what we're going through reflects in the children. So, yeah. So what about children, their children? Any tips on getting them to sleep? OK, so when I work with sleep, I don't work with a method that will fix everything um, and I also don't work with what I call extrinsic tools so to try and change somebody's behavior you can either try and work extrinsically so try to use something external to try to me make them behave in a different way so what I'm really talking about is behave is um, punishments and rewards Mm. So if you want to either make your child do something or stop them doing something, the idea with punishment, so whether that's send them to their room or losing something, privileges or something like that as a punishment, or trying to make them do something by giving them a reward. So the common one for this age group would be like sticker reward charts or something, or if you sleep in your room tonight for the next week, you can have a toy. Um, all of those work on the basis that the child is not sleeping because they are not motivated to do so. But actually, it's it's you know it's the human innate drive is for us to sleep. So children need to sleep and they want to sleep. They don't need to be motivated to do so. So we don't mm -hmm. have to punish them and demotivate them, and we don't have to reward them and motivate them. They're already motivated to sleep. If they're not sleeping, what we must understand is that there's an underlying reason. And those extrinsic punishing and rewarding, which is so common at sleep at this age, is completely naive and ignorant to whatever the underlying issue is. So when I work with sleep, we have to always consider the why so what is the reason why your child is struggling with sleep? It's really important we don't go straight in and say, OK, we're going to try and fix it by doing this, this and the other, because, again, you're naive to the why. So we have to start off with the why. So the common why is at this age. Do you want me to go through yes. what some of the reasons are? So the, the common reasons why children struggle at this age is I have to say that the most common reason is parental expectation. So by that, I mean parents expect their child to do something that is perhaps not right for that child. So the common one here is that we expect them to sleep more than they need to. I really see that a loss in this age group. So I have parents say to me, my child, just I, I really struggle to get them to sleep till nine o'clock at night. And they get up at six or seven a.m. So they need to go to sleep earlier. But actually, 
nobody really knows how much sleep anybody needs. There's a lot of um, very intelligent scientists who come together yearly and sort of agree on rough guidelines, the National Sleep Foundation. So the guidelines for the age I'm talking about, which is mostly kind of five to 13 years, the guidelines for sleep for that is between nine and 11 hours in a 24 hour period. Now, what they don't do is if your child wakes up in the night and they have a nightmare and they're awake for 20 minutes, that's not taken off of the total. So let's imagine we have a child who goes to bed at seven o'clock at night and they only need nine hours of sleep. That means actually they're ready to start the day at 4 a.m. Or alternatively, if you have a child who gets up at seven o'clock in the morning who only needs nine hours sleep, that means they don't need to go to bed till 10 p.m. Mm. And in that in you have a child who wakes up at 7 a.m. Or let's say they wake up at 6 a.m. If they wake up at 6 a.m., we know that if they only need nine hours sleep, they don't need to go to bed till 9 p.m. And if that parent is trying to get that child to go to bed at 7, 7.30, 8 p.m., it's going to be a nightmare because mm. the child simply does not need the amount of sleep the parent is trying to get them to get. But for some reason, we bizarrely think bedtime needs to be between 7 and 8 p.m., but nearer the 7, 7.30 mm. time. But we also want our child to sleep in longer in the morning and we're just trying to get them to tell you that they don't need 12 hours sleep. So expectations are key and don't try to get them to have more sleep than they need. If you want a later morning, then they need to have a later bedtime. You can't have early evenings and morning waking at 7 a.m. and not early in the morning. Does that does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, it makes total sense. And you, the way you're talking, I'm thinking, yeah, that really makes sense. Look, so basically work out how... And also for us to, you know, work out how much we need to yeah, sleep. Exactly. And if you, you know when And there's always a range, you know, for us, we don't need eight hours sleep. We need something between like seven and ten hours. So if you're a seven yes. hour and somebody tries to make you sleep for 11 hours, you, it's going to be awful. If you're on 11 hours and somebody tries to make you sleep for seven, that's going to be tricky as well. So we have to Absolutely. treat them as individuals. And you know when when your child is waking up full of beans they have yeah. had enough sleep so if but they... actually they could wake up and be really miserable and really angry and very upset and people say well that means that they're not getting enough sleep ah. that's maybe just how they wake up it doesn't mean that they need more sleep that they wake up miserable that just, i wake up miserable every day i get enough sleep i just don't like waking up do you know okay <laughs> i've yeah. never woken up oh what a wonderful day let's welcome the day i think oh really and I'm quite snappy and grouchy for a good half an hour until I wake up properly. But I get in my okay. sleep. So expectation okay. number one and the timing of bedtime. So we know from research at this age that in order to sleep well, they need to have released um, enough melatonin, the hormone of sleep. Um, and obviously what happens in the daytime when the sun's up, it's very bright. Um, we release cortisol to keep us awake and alert. In the evening, as the sun starts to set and also as the temperature starts to drop, that is reduced and we start to release melatonin, the hormone of sleep. In order to sleep well, we need a certain level of melatonin to already have been released. And we know in the age range I'm talking about that it doesn't really happen before 8 p.m. So from 8 p.m. onwards is when I would aim to get a school aged child to sleep. I would not aim for them to go to sleep earlier unless they needed it and they went to sleep happily. But that's okay. slightly later. But we have insanely early bedtimes in Western Europe compared to the rest of the world. But actually not even the whole of Western Europe. You know, if you look at Spain, for instance, they would have a siesta and bedtime wouldn't be till 9 or mm. 10 p.m. But, you know, the bedtimes are normally too early, not just because of sleep need, but because of melatonin secretion as well. There but, are going to so, be a lot of happy children listening. Well, they're not they're listening <laughs> to this. And unhappy parents. Who I know, but, you know, parents... Why o'clock? clock? <laughs> and parents are like, when do I get me time? And you just yeah. think, I talk to so many parents who spend an hour or two desperately trying to get their child to sleep in the evening. And I'm like, actually, if you did it slightly different, you did it an hour later, it'd probably take you half an hour. So you're still going to be not having adult time for that time. But it, it makes it less time and much easier for you if you just hold off a little bit. And a lot rather less than stress. Struggling. Yeah. So do you want me to carry on? There's, with Let's spew out all the reasons why they might not sleep. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> So obviously the expectations and the timing is one. Um, I think also what they eat is a big issue at this age. So if we are deficient in certain things, it can impact on sleep. And some of the things we eat, like what we actually eat, can impact as well. 
A lot of people think that sugar causes issues with sleep. It doesn't. It's a myth. Sugar doesn't make us hyperactive. I'm not saying eat lots of sugar. It's, it's not good for you. But what we know from research is sugar doesn't cause hyperactivity. There's quite a lot of interesting research looking at that with children. And when parent, parents are told their child has had a lot of sugar, they believe their child is more hyperactive, like it's a nocebo effect mm. for the parent. But mm. it doesn't. It actually causes crashes. I don't know if you've ever had loads of chocolate cake and two hours later you just want to sleep. So it's not the sugar, but I would be aware of caffeine at this age. So here we're looking, I know some parents will say have a cup of tea, um, but also chocolate, you know, if it, particularly it's high cocoa later in the day, I'd be aware of that. Um, and also I'd be aware of artificial colorings and additives, particularly the orange and the red and the purple ones. Um, interestingly, I'm not going to name names now, but the most famous um, analgesic painkiller medicine for children that's bright pink, that has E numbers in it that create hyperactivity and can cause issues with sleep so be aware of what they're eating avoid those artificial colors hyperactivity is normally caused not by the sugar but by the colors that accompany the, all the candy and stuff um yeah. in terms but it, 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 these is all so simple i think but we just don't think about it um in terms of the deficiencies there are i think there's four specific ones i'd look at um what I should say is all children are naturally picky eaters. It's not a problem if your child is a picky eater. It's actually nature. It's science. They are children are born naturally neophobic. So they're born naturally phobic of trying new foods. It's like nature's way of protecting them against poisoning. Yeah. Like to accidentally consume something back when we were hunter gatherers. So fussy mm -hmm. and picky eating, only eating beige things, really normal. Don't worry about it. However, what then accompanies this naturally picky eating is deficiencies in things that really impact sleep. So the biggest one is iron. Iron deficiency is probably one of the causes of the most sleep issues in childhood. Um, commonly with an iron deficient child, you'll find something called periodic limb movement disorder. So they'll be really fidgety and tossing and turning and fidgety legs and maybe saying I've got little crampy legs or, you know, constantly kicking duvets off. If your child is like that, then I'd really look at the amount of iron they're eating. There's, um, I've recommended a website called the British Dietetic Association. So if you go into a search engine and type British Dietetic Association or just BDA plus iron fact sheet on their website, mm. they have a great fact sheet that tells you how much iron children need at each age. And they give a list of foods and what's contained in them. So you can work out how much a child gets and if they're getting enough and how to increase it. Um, and there are, there are some really great child friendly foods that help with iron deficiency, things like um, dried apricots. That you, mm. It doesn't have to be just red meat and green leafy vegetables. There are plenty of other ways. But iron deficiency is probably the top deficiency that causes sleep problems at this age. Um, magnesium deficiency can impact as well. Um, we need magnesium to relax and rest. Um, so basically nuts and dark chocolate will will be everything you need. And I, I'm an advocate of trying to eat more rather than supplementing. Um, particularly with iron, I would not supplement. If you think your your child is low in iron, then you need to see your doctor, your family doctor or your GP. Don't just give an iron supplement. It can cause all sorts of issues with um, your gut flora and constipation. Yeah. Um, what else is there? Vitamin D. Vitamin D deficiency is linked to um, melatonin secretion. So at the moment in the summer with lovely weather, it basically just means get outside and get in the sun. The NHS recommends that we all take a vitamin D supplement every day. So something I'd look into. Um, the last one is an omega-3 deficiency, so your fatty acids. Mm. So um, here we're looking at oily fish, salmon, mackerel, herring, tuna, sardines, or we're looking at sort of plant versions, so things like flaxseed and chia seed and seaweed. But um, again, there is some research showing that if children are deficient in omega-3 fatty acids, they are more likely to have difficulties going to sleep, staying asleep, and more likely to have mm. something called a parasomnia, which is um, a sleep disorder that happens um, a bit like an electrical blip of sleep. So parasomnias are things like night night terrors, night sleepwalking, sleep talking, things like that. So if you do have a child who sleepwalks or sleep talks, then I'd look at omega-3. Wow. What else is there? I'd also consider the microbiome, so your gut flora and your bacteria and your digestive tracts. We know that there's more and more research coming out now linking the microbiome to the secretion of melatonin and the um, control of circadian rhythms, the body clock. And mm -hmm. if the microbiome is not optimal, which it could be maybe because of a series of antibiotics, um, we know from talking babies that babies who are born by cesarean will have a different microbiome than babies who are born vaginally. So um, if the microbiome is not optimal, they've not got loads of those lovely gut flora, that can impact on their hormones of sleep. 
So there I'd be looking at something like a probiotic supplement and also prebiotics, so things like kefir and fermented food and stuff like that. Mm. I've got a list to make sure I go through everything here. Um, what else? I'd also look for other sort of medical and physical causes. So things like if your child has eczema or dry, itchy skin, of course, they're going to struggle to sleep. Um, and there, there are other sort of physical things. For instance, if your child is a mouth breather and they sleep with their mouth open and they snore a lot, um, two things. One, they might have enlarged adenoids. So adenoids sort of things up here, the part of your immune system. If they're very enlarged, it could... Um, cause obstructive sleep apnea and so it could cause children to temporarily stop breathing so what you'll commonly find with a child like this is they'll have their mouth open they'll breathe through their mouth and every now and again they'll stop breathing and then they'll go <gasps> and start breathing again or they might just snore really loudly plus have their mouth open um, the other thing that is related to that is obviously with their mouth open all night they get a really dry throat and a sore throat so they'll need to wake up because their mouth's sore and they need a drink um, I've had two children that had their adenoids out and it, it was bizarre. They both snored really loudly. And the second they had them out, it was so quiet that I had to keep checking they were still alive at night. But they both slept a lot better after their adenoids were out. So it, it doesn't apply to all children who mouth breathe. Some just do it and it's not a problem, but it's something I'd be aware of. Um, I'd also be aware of things like if they're sensory needs, something like sensory processing disorder, again, rare, but something I would keep in mind particularly if the child is um, struggles with certain things touching them or, or or not touching them and they're either sensory seeking or sensory avoiding I'd be having a chat with the GP let me go through my list I've got two or three more things sorry this isn't a conversation is it this is just me reeling information off I just think no honestly I think people are finding this really useful I hope keep so. going I'm just thinking yeah. you're just sitting there going no um, well, I'm fascinated yeah let me do two more things or three more things and I'll stop talking um so we also need to look at the environment this applies at any age um if we go back to circadian rhythms and cortisol in the day and melatonin at night what we need for night sleep is a cool room which is difficult at the moment I'm so hot but um when our body temperature is higher it's harder to release melatonin so what we need for the best sleep is a cool room we need to be warm in it so I'm not saying be cold but we need that temperature ideally between 16 and 18 degrees which means at the moment lots of fans and open windows and stuff and in the winter it ideally means no no heating on at night we tend to make the room yeah. too warm and then give children like thinner pajamas or a lower top duvet but actually it needs to be thicker pajamas thicker duvet cooler room like i i have my window open year round um mm. then we also want to think about the lighting so light is a huge issue with sleep in the daytime, obviously, it's very bright and that stimulates us to be awake and release cortisol. When the light starts to fade at kind of sort of 6 p.m. or earlier in the winter, what it, what happens if you if you are a physicist and you split light with a, with a glass pyramid, if you remember doing that at school, and you created the sort of the spectrum of light, you would see that it turns um, from very blue, from being on a blue wavelength or a high wavelength to being very red or on a lower wavelength. For those who are techie, anything over 600 nanometers. So what we know is that light naturally in the evening, if you look at a sunset, is very red. Mm. And red light is the only light that doesn't impact sleep negatively. So any light your child is exposed to for two hours before bedtime until all through the night, until the next morning, has a massive impact on their sleep. So the worst thing we do is use screens. So that, that goes for us as well as children, because screens emit lots of blue light. So here I'm talking TVs, tablets, phone screens, even, you know, video calling with nan and granddad or something at half an hour before bedtime. That can be problematic because of the light from the screen. Mm -hmm. So no screens for two hours before bed. And if you use screens yourself make sure, or phones, make sure you have a blue light filter or set it to night mode. Or there's a good app called um, F-Lux, F dot L-U-X, which takes the blue out of the screen. So light before two hours before bed is really important. The lighting in your bathroom is probably the worst light in your whole home for sleep. It's very bright LED spotlights or fluorescent strip lights, which are incredibly blue. And that's like shining a big sun in your child's face before bedtime. Do not use your main bathroom lights in the evening at all. I would use little candle lights or best lights um, for a bathroom. Actually, I use red fairy lights that are battery operated and put them in a glass oh. jar. 
and just use that or natural light's fine because it would naturally be changing towards the red spectrum and then in the child's bedroom for story time if you go into like a department store and you look for a night light 90 percent of them will be white blue purple or pink mm -hmm. every single one of those are bad for sleep every single one of those will inhibit sleep by inhibiting melano melatonin release it basically tells the body it's daytime wake up so you do not want blue light white light pink light purple light green light or just regular white light in your child's room the actually the worst light bulbs are energy saving bulbs you know the ones we all have now great yeah. for the environment really bad for sleep mm -hmm. so avoid what about the salt lamps Salt yeah, lamps. I love them. I have them. They're very pretty, but they do not filter enough of the white light. They only work if you put a red bulb in them or like okay. an old incandescent bulb. But if you put a, an energy saving light bulb in them, they're not a good enough filter. They're a natural filter. You know, you can see it's not filtering enough. You've taken it from so, being less blue to slightly less blue, but it's not on the red so, spectrum. So just get some red bulbs and put them in yeah. the in the light so you can you can buy color changing light bulbs you know the ones you yeah. get with the remotes they're like eight pounds they're fantastic mm. also mm. you don't have to get up to turn you can dim them and light but change them so i'd mm. use like the dark orangey peach or the red only or you can get light bulbs that are like two pounds for um if you go into a pet store for using vivariums if you keep snakes or reptiles yeah. or I don't know if people remember like the old gas fires that they had red yes. light bulbs in and it made like circles going around. I'm showing how old yeah. I am now. Uh, red fairy lights, the little red lights that go on the back of a the bike. They're really good to use in the bathroom because they're better. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Red LEDs. You can buy kids night lights that just change colour. So anything that's red. You can also get non-red red light, which is really confusing. So it's light that looks kind of a peachy white colour. But if you analysed it, it's actually over 600 nanometers. So it actually technically falls into the red light capacity, but it looks more orangey, yellowy, peachy. So mm -hmm. just look for non-red non red light. There's um, NASA make one for about 180 pounds. Um, or there I think are, I'll stick to the company, two pound yeah, one. There's a company <laughs> called Lighting Science, and theirs is about ten pounds. Um, there's a company called Lumi who make. I think they're most known for wake up lights, but they also make a kids light, which is non red red light. But so either non red red light or just plain old red light from two hours before sleep, no screens, all through the night. You know, don't leave their door ajar and have the hallway light on unless the hallway light is red, because that will still impact as well. It's it's such a big thing when you think about lighting. So cool room, red light only. Um, humidity is important as well. So um, particularly if they mouth breathe, adding some moisture back in the environment, particularly if there's air conditioning or central heating. It's really important to get some moisture back in. We want a higher humidity level. Um, so what I use is a little aromatherapy diffuser that's electronic plugs in, works with water vapour. They're like 15, yeah. 20 pounds. They're really cheap. And that puts some moisture back in they also you can use those as a night light because you can set them on red so that works really well um what else in the room the other thing is as well is if night waking is an issue you need the environment the child goes to sleep in to be the same as the one they wake up in so for instance if they wake up and they're very upset and scared because you're not there you need to make sure that everything that was present when they went to sleep is there in the middle of the night so here, I mean, if they go to sleep with some of your music, for instance, the parents need to play it on repeat all night. So we don't yes. we think about ways to get them to sleep with some music or meditations or white noise or something. And that's great. But if they wake up in the night, we need to make sure that the environment is constant. So that music plays on repeat and also one track only. Don't make a playlist or cycle through YouTube or something. One track on repeat oh, all night. Until same the morning. track. Wow, really? Yeah, because if they go to sleep to one track and they wake to a different one, that's like, well, this is really different. Amazing. And if parents yeah. um, sing a lullaby to sleep, that's fine. But record yourself doing it and play that back and repeat all night. If you read them a story to sleep, record yourself reading a story and play that on repeat all night. You know, so I recorded a, a, a relaxation similar to one so you have for my daughter. So it was in my voice. And that was bizarre because like for two years, I just heard myself talking all night with this being yeah. played. But it, it really works. Um, so works. anything that's present when they go to sleep, we want to be there all night. So, for instance, we don't want them to go to sleep with a light on and then you turn it off when you leave the room because that's different so the light should be the same the sound should be the same temperature should be the same everything should be the same um i also use i mentioned the aromatherapy diffuser that works really well if the parents um 
whoever does bedtime puts some on a hanky or just puts some oil onto them and wears it as sort of scent or perfume so the child associates mm. the smell with them and then you pop a couple of drops of the same oil in the diffuser so that the whole bedroom mm. then smells of the parent but yeah, it's yeah lovely and then also I'd recommend that they have a, like a cuddly toy or a blanket that they snuggle to go to sleep. You know, you are never too old to have a teddy bear to go to sleep with, you know, even adults, if, you know, absolutely all for it at any age, but make sure that they're cuddling it and they're going to sleep with it and then it's with them all night. Yeah. And that, if, if they do struggle and you want to get them to sleep, but you want to kind of tuck them up in bed and leave them to go to sleep themselves, having a what I call a bedtime buddy really helps. So having a cuddly toy and saying to them, now, when I leave, the cuddly toy might get a bit scared that I've left. So I need you to comfort the cuddly toy. And also in the night, if the cuddly toy has a bad dream, I need you to give them a big squeeze and tell them it's going to be OK. So what the child is doing there is transferring their emotions onto the cuddly toy. And in a sense, they're self-soothing by yeah. soothing the toy. But Amazing. it works much better. A lot of parents will say, if you wake up in the night and you're scared, give your teddy a hug. And the child just doesn't do that. But if you say, if the teddy wakes in the night, I need you to look after it and give it a hug. That works really well. Yeah, definitely. So, and the last thing I'd say is the, the routine we mentioned right at the beginning is really important. So two things that make the biggest impact on sleep, whatever the issue is, is waking up at the same time every day and, getting, and going to bed at the same time every day. For mm. if you're talking a two month old or even us, mm. you're best thing you can do is have regular inconsistent wait times and sleep times and also have a bedtime routine that is predictable and the same every night so I would start I actually consider all the time after dinner time to be part of a bedtime routine so okay. I'd have dinner the best thing if you're if your child is struggling to go to bed and refusing bedtime at night I'd really recommend putting your phone down and just getting down and playing with them for half an hour to an hour so, you know, letting your child control the play, doing whatever it is they want to do, whatever age they are, and having that really good one-to-one -one connecting playtime with them. And it might, if you've got more than one child, obviously it's, it's one parent to two children, getting outside at the moment and having a really crazy, wonderful playtime after dinner is really helpful. And then mm. after the playtime, I'd come in and I'd give them a bedtime snack, however much they ate at dinner, because it helps to regulate their blood sugar helps to make sure that okay. they've got lots of sleep nutrients. So um, I always try to give a bedtime snack that has magnesium, iron, and something called tryptophan in it, which is an amino acid, which helps melatonin release. So my two best bedtime snacks are wholemeal or brown toast with something like almond butter, um, or peanut butter, but almond butter is slightly better, or oatmeal with something like um, diced bananas and um, apricots. Um, smashed avocado on toast is quite a good one as well something like that but just to double check nice. that they're not hungry their blood sugar is stable and you've got sleep nutrients then from bedtime snack I'd go onto the bedtime routine so whether that's a bath or a shower or just getting them changed into the bedroom I do the same things in the same order every night so okay. you know like laying out their pajamas or asking them to put them on if you read a bedtime story try and read the same bedtime story every night people are like what you read the same book every night but for children that consistency and that, that replication mm. that every single night is really reassuring to them it's the same way why mm. many at the moment will struggle with the lack of routine of being at school mm. but or why lots of children will like to watch the same film or the same tv program over and over again and they know all the words mm. it's because they like mm. that feeling of control and knowing what comes next mm. Mm. so i'd read the same book every night um and i try not to make it a particularly exciting book and i wouldn't want one with like pressing buttons and lifting flaps yeah, um, like a calm book or if you're not reading a book then I would put on like one of your relaxation CDs but do it in the same kind of order and the same time each night mm. so that they, they know what comes next it's like literally it's dinner time and it's now kids it's play time obviously if you've got a teenager they're not well, they might want to play with you actually might have started to be much more interested in spending time with me but it's that it's reconnection time not necessarily play time mm. but they know after reconnection time or play time it's snack and after snack time it's bedtime that even if they can't tell the time they know what's coming and it's predictable and I would stick to that as much as you can even on holiday yeah. and then I think the I last thing that's so important is that connection that reconnection with you I think children who yeah. really put off bedtime if you've tried everything considered the timing and the diet and the environment 
I think it, it comes down to the, the connection with you. They don't want to leave you. You know, you if you've got a partner, you get to be with your partner overnight. They get to be alone in their room by themselves. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, I always remember as a child thinking how unfair it was that my mum and dad got to be in a bed together and I had to be in a different room. Like, I actually mm. remember it now. And when I was ill, my mum used to let me come in bed with her and my dad would go in my room. And I, I used to actually like being ill because it meant I could go and snuggle with my mum. But yeah. I think that that connection, if they feel connected and close to you enough in the daytime, they've got much less of an issue being apart from you at night. So I'm going to stop amazing. talking. I have rambled at you for so oh, long. Oh, Sarah, I mean, that was just amazing. So many tips. I know there are messages coming through saying, yeah, this is this is brilliant. This is just what I need to hear in terms of the timing, you know, the, the timing, the amount of time children need. Um, and, yeah, and for me, you just lost me at, peanut butter on toast before bed so you know, <laughs> okay, I'm just night. there that's if that's my takeaway literally <laughs> toast, toast, butter, avocado on toast yeah as, uh, avocado and almond butter on toast and some oatmeal I, I can, can do, do that I do, I do that or with marmite would that be allowed yeah oh I don't I used to love Maybe marmite not. when I was little but I can't bear it now it's very strange yeah good for beef vitamins isn't it which aren't hugely impacted yeah. in sleep banana and almonds go well together so that on toast that would yeah, be great exactly. so banana is good for but, potassium it has a little bit of magnesium but yeah really good amazing and also um one one thing that i recommend often i don't i'd be really interested in your take on this is magnesium baths or putting magnesium in or do you just prefer to go internally yeah so oh this is really tricky so actually i okay. use epsom Bath. Yeah, I really like it. It makes my skin feel nice. I, I think it helps me sleep. Who knows if it's placebo or not? So scientifically, there's not really any evidence for topical magnesium. If you if you okay. sort of know about the biology of skin and all the barriers and stuff, it makes scientifically it makes no sense that something could cross through the skin and get into okay. your bloodstream. And you know, it just doesn't happen. However, I did read some research last year that was working with pig skin, bizarrely, and they were showing that it did make it through the skin. In. So I would say, you know, 90% of or 99% of scientists would say it's just a placebo effect. Yeah. But there is this pig skin research that shows it does cross to the bloodstream. Yeah. So I actually well, take a magnesium supplement. Um uh -huh. if I don't think I've had enough magnesium, but I really like dark chocolate and that's the most fun way to get it. So yeah, I think I'd always advocate eating it, but certainly the I think the only harm with magnesium salts is the um, the money that they cost. You know, it's actually cheaper. I get an industrial grade tub of Epsom salt that's about fifteen pounds, rather than yeah. one of the sachets of magnesium flakes, which are like ten pounds. They're no yeah, different. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So get just the, the industrial grade Epsom salt. But I think the only thing to watch out for, apart from maybe spending some money, it doesn't work, is it's a laxative. So if you have a child who likes to drink bath water, don't use them. But that's it's the only bad effect. Yeah. I just think, you know, give it a shot. If it were, even if it's placebo yeah. effect, it's absolutely cool if it works for you. The only yeah. bad side effect is that if they drink it, they might go to the loo a lot. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. And I think for us, I think the best thing, magnesium bath, eating dark chocolate. Yeah. And I think, I think it's comes back to the... <laughs> It's partly the self-care, you know, for an adult having a bath and that whole ritual. I, I like to have candles when I have a bath and I'm really picky oh, yeah. about like the, the oils I put in the bath and stuff like that. And it's it's a real trip. I'm a real bath person. I don't like showers. I like to just wallow in a bath rather than stand up in the shower. For me, it's such a treat and I make it quite elaborate. And mm. I think that would be my self-care, actually, is just having a bath. Yeah. Maybe I'll take a magazine or a book with me and I'll sit in the water for like half an hour till it gets cold. Yeah. But that really helps me when I go to sleep. And I think because yes, of the stuff, there is, there's actually evidence, oddly, if you can get in a bath and you like and you can cope with it quite hot. So yeah. hot enough that it raises your body temperature by sort of half degree or degree. If you get like flushed cheeks, if you yeah. can tolerate that, not hot, but definitely hotter than 37 degrees. What happens when you get out is your body temperature is slightly elevated. And when you get out of the bath, your body temperature drops quite quickly, pretty rapidly. And that tricks your body into thinking that it's sleep time. And it actually makes you release a spurt of melatonin. There's a, um, oh. 
there's a good exercise if you um, go on the internet and search for, I think it was the BBC did an experiment with Kate Silverton and made her have a hot bath and get out and to, to blood uh, body temperature and her melatonin levels. And actually hot baths and then letting yourself cool off afterwards helps you release more melatonin. And more yeah. So I'm definitely going to try that with the chocolate. Maybe Definitely. not at the moment when it's like so hot, I actually just want to go and sit in a cold bath, right? Now. That's true. That's very true. <laughs> oh, Sarah, thank you. You are truly amazing. So much, um, so much information and so much important stuff for parents. Thank you for all your work. And can you remind us what your website is, please? Yeah, so anyone it's wants just to... my name. So sarahockwell-smith.com. I've got loads of articles on it if you just there's a little search bar just to search sleep and you'll get yeah. lots of and also your books i think somebody uh i think it was joanne talking about eating um and she mentioned your gentle what was it called yeah eating eating book. Book. Gentle. really imaginative titles aren't they <laughs> Amazing. yeah and, and she was recommending yeah recommending that to everyone so that's really and that's what i mean i just love the the link between all the speakers it, everything is all linked so beautifully thank you sarah thank you so much you're welcome thank, thank you, you everybody bye, bye.